Healthcare. My name is Jeff Gomez. I am the CEO of Starlight Runner Entertainment. We're a New York-based production company that specializes in narrative design and transmedia production. It is so fantastic to be here to speak with you, the Future of Film Incubator. Um, it's wonderful to be here at Garden Studios in London. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you about uh, these fascinating developments in storytelling. Uh, storytelling has changed in, uh, uh, over the course of the past uh, 10 or 20 years, and I've been noticing some uh, dynamic new models which are transforming the way that we tell stories. Um, uh, we have new technologies that are enabling us to make stories uh, more robust, more participative, and more able to be distributed across uh, multiple media platforms, um, but also more immersive. And maybe, I don't know, maybe stories will be able to, to teach us something more about the way we're living today. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I was born in the early 1960s in New York City. Um, I entered the world uh, in a, a chaotic uh, environment. Um, my mom and dad were people who were at the lowest rung of the economic ladder in New York. Uh, so the uh, areas, the projects, the uh, Lower East Side of, of Manhattan was troubled, uh, often quite violent. Um, that violence uh, surrounded me as a child. Uh, and I was, I don't know, I guess I was sensitive. <laughs> and so uh, being able to, to take all this in was, was really a little bit uh, too much for me, um, especially when I was on the receiving end of violence. I would watch uh, uh, cartoons and movies and try to escape, try to run away from all this sort of thing. And uh, I entered into uh, the worlds of stories, fairy tales, um, uh, cartoon shows, movies, uh, especially ones that were serious and um, uh, a kind of epic in scope. The longer the story, the better for me because I wanted to stay in these imaginary worlds. I wasn't always satisfied and so I began to imagine my own worlds um, and in doing so I needed it, for some reason somehow to study the way that these stories were told. I didn't have the means to create movies or write novels or, you know, um, uh, uh, develop games, at least sophisticated ones. So I, um, um, I, I decided just to create worlds in my imagination. And uh, to do so, I started to study how these storytellers, people like J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, uh, created such convincing and rich uh, narrative universes. Uh, what I found was that uh, storytelling around the world throughout history had um, uh, these, these uh, kind of deeper, more foundational elements in uh, common. They hinged on human desire, um, and often they were maps that kind of allowed for us as the audience to understand how these characters grappled with the situations they were in and slowly climbed their way out of their situations toward some kind of success. Um, uh, I didn't really have the medium to express myself well until the age of computers in the late 1980s began. Um, uh, instead of being all alone, I was able to uh, uh, reach out and, and talk to other people, uh, develop uh, story worlds that uh, uh, other people can play in. And what I noticed was that um, uh, the idea of participative narrative, um, so that we are not just leaning back and watching the story unfold or even reading it, we're leaning forward <clears throat> and actually interacting with one another as the story unfolds around us. That was really, really fascinating to me. It, it, it seemed as if I had found the mortar uh, for the various bricks of storytelling uh, that I wanted to uh, kind of play with and build. 
and build I did. Um, I was able to enter into the gaming industry and then the comic book industry and then the video game uh, uh, industry and ultimately uh, Hollywood. Um, and um, my expertise, the thing that people wanted me to help them with was to not simply be able to uh, deconstruct a screenplay or some kind of uh, uh, ordinary story, but to see the potential in the world of those scripts and comic books and novels in order to ex help people expand those worlds so that they operated in concert across multiple media platforms. We know this commonly today in terms of things like the Marvel Cinematic Universe or Harry Potter's uh, uh, Hogwarts uh, Wizarding World, um, uh, the DC Universe and things like that. But back in the 1990s when I was doing this work, in the early aughts, that was still relatively a rare thing to, uh, uh, to understand. Um, so my expertise had an application uh, with the big Hollywood studios, and I got to play with the most incredible toys uh, you could imagine. I even got to invent a few of my own, uh, like the uh, Turok Dinosaur Hunter uh, video game for the Nintendo 64, uh, some of the world of Magic the Gathering, uh, the world of Hot Wheels in the early aughts, uh, really, really fun stuff. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I never forgot where I came from in terms of, of the way I grew up. I uh, have dedicated myself to going back into those neighborhoods and, um, and teaching and trying to uh, understand why um, uh, uh, poverty and um, uh, violence and, uh, and things that are actually, I feel, doing damage to our world have persisted. And uh, unfortunately, I've been troubled by the fact that, uh, that those, those elements have persisted. Um, uh, it, it seems as if we have not benefited enough from the beautiful complexity of our uh, technology, and instead things have gotten hyper-complicated, um, uh, you know, kind of like a bird's nest of wires that we can't seem to undo. And, um, and my, my fear is that things like social media, which have uh, allowed us to express ourselves um, so freely, have become uh, toxic because there are uh, uh, factions involved which are generating uh, uh, false information, uh, misleading us, and, and turning us against one another. Um, uh, it's it's a, a real concern. There are um, uh, three ways that um, we are harming ourselves. Um, our greed, um, our weapons, our thirst for power has made us capable of physically destroying ourselves. Um, our pollutants and disregard for the fragility of nature have made us capable of destroying our environment. And our technology and irresponsible use of communications are unmooring us uh, from a common understanding of, of reality. And um, uh, and um, what I'm concerned about here and what I want to talk to you about is the fact that um, a lot of uh, the, the kind of old methodologies of storytelling have not been effective enough at uh, giving us a roadmap uh, to, uh, to move away from this kind of self-terminating uh, situation. Here's the reason. Um, uh, the hero's journey is kind of hardwired into our brains. Uh, from the dawn of humanity, uh, we grew up in tiny enclaves, uh, even caves. Um, uh, and as we uh, uh, reached adolescence, we were taught how to survive in the outdoors so that we could venture forth, get what it is that was necessary for our uh, community to survive, and bring it back. Uh, so that the community, community can benefit. This created a kind of circular hero's journey, uh, the one that Joseph Campbell uh, talks about. Um, and, um, and look, it was a, an, an excellent method of, of survival. Um, it, these were narratives that were passed down from one generation to the next to train us to go out and assert what we believe to be right what is right is the survival of our tribe, after all. 
uh, and asserting that right um, uh, uh, caused us to come into conflict with what was uh, going on out there. Uh, the world was a uh, dangerous place. Um, uh, anything, animals, uh, other tribes, uh, things like that were out there that we had to surmount in order to bring that reward, that boon, uh, back to our uh, people. And so we asserted our rightness <clears throat> on uh, what was going on out there, and, um, uh, and that was a survival mechanism. The problem with this, people, is that um, uh, this was, uh, you know, a, a, a clear and concise narrative that um, uh, hinged on uh, the fact that there were a, a great deal of resources out there and that we could go out and, um, and, and achieve this uh, uh, simply. Um, now that the world has become crowded, now that the world has given each of us a means of expression, <laughs> Um, we are uh, uh, basically tripping that circular circuit in our minds when we communicate through social media or when we communicate as uh, leaders of our families, communities, nations, and, and things like that. And so we are asserting our rightness on a whole lot of people's wrongness. <laughs> um, we are all going out on our individual hero's journeys and we are coming into conflict um, at, at rates that are just gigantic, <clears throat> uh, massive, exponentially greater than when we uh, were uh, coherent as, as communities and, um, and operating along uh, the same lines. Um, I, I, um, I started to discover that, um, that this kind of a complication, as opposed to complexity, um, was uh, at the root of a lot of the problems that we're experiencing right now as uh, uh, the human race. And, um, and I endeavored to search for uh, solutions for this. One of them uh, I found uh, when I was researching uh, indigenous Australian um, uh, uh, mythology and patterns of communication. Uh, Starlight Runner had been engaged by uh, universities in Australia to understand how um, Aborigines were navigating through college because they were failing. And, uh, and well, uh, the, the, the reason they were failing was because the hero's journey <laughs> circular uh, assertion was being made on them when they really uh, uh, thought their, their minds operated in an entirely different way, a networked way. Um, a way that used um, signs, symbols, images, um, uh, nonlinear, often nonverbal uh, means to uh, uh, connect with each other. And, um, uh, and this had moved them forward as a people in a far, far different way from the way that, that we were uh, moving. And yet, if you look at this pedagogy, um, uh, you can see the interconnectedness of things uh, uh, reminded me very much of how we are moving through uh, this new uh, communication model. Uh, the, the internet, the way that we uh, interact with the internet, and the way that stories are told through the internet, um, uh, you know, seems very similar to that pedagogy. And so um, I began to study this, and the conclusion that I've come to, people, is that we uh, can no longer uh, simply assert our rightness on wrongness. We can no longer um, uh, leave ourselves to the simplicity of the hero's journey, which is fraught with uh, direct conflict. Um, our narratives uh, function more like lightning bolts. Our super narratives start somewhere and end somewhere, yes, but boy, do they move quickly. Boy, can they uh, show up, can they appear everywhere all at once. And, um, and they burn brightly. Uh, they are not just the stories that are being told to us. They're the stories that we are participating in. Story has become not just the a core narrative that we can lean back and enjoy. They have become the thing that we play with, that we talk about, that we um, uh, participate in, uh, in uh, spectacular 
uh, and uh, a complex fashion. So when we talk about collective journey narratives, um, uh, we, we can initially believe them to be hero's journey style. In Orange is the New Black, you have uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know, pretty blonde girl who enters into a prison and we believe that she is going to um, encounter all of these uh, uh, horrific uh, difficulties uh, and we're cheering for her to kind of make it through. Um, uh, so all of these other characters initially seem to be other, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, menaces. Uh, but really, uh, that was a Trojan horse. Um, uh, Orange is the New Black is a collective journey. The protagonist is one of a collective. And uh, what we've learned is that each of those characters um, are people who are caught up in a system, and not just the prisoners, the prison guards, the administrators of the prison, even the corporations that own the prisons are all a part of a system that is deeply flawed. And um, the only way uh, to uh, resolve this situation is for the system either uh, to collapse in on itself and be destroyed and all the people, all the lives within it uh, terribly harmed, or um, uh, for there to be some kind of reconciliation uh, so that an, at least an aspect of the system can be improved. Um, in collective journey narratives, we don't need to necessarily be harmed by something that happened, um, uh, at least directly. We can uh, see something uh, that is an injustice and attempt to um, uh, fix it because we can be driven by a cause. Um, the narrative uh, in collective journey um, uh, operates by viewing things through multiple perspectives. So um, uh, it, it doesn't matter what the gender is of the character. Uh, and in fact, uh, we, we step back from that and look at the uh, uh, characters and empathize with all of the characters, even the antagonists, uh, because we need to understand collective journey must reveal why these uh, uh, characters are benefiting from these flawed systems and what's in their minds so that we can understand how best to communicate with one another to resolve these uh, um, uh, complex problems or complicated problems. Um, the challenge in collective journey can be huge and even pervasive. In so many uh, uh, movies and, and TV shows and novels that we read, um, uh, the uh, uh, characters um, are, are faced with an antagonist, some of, some of whom might represent um, a flawed system, a, a villainous uh, or unjust uh, a system. And it's not just that um, the, 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 the character defeats the, uh, the, the bad guy, so to speak. But if you step back far enough, the system persists, <clears throat> okay? So there hasn't been a true and deep change made to, to the universe, the story world. Uh, this is illustrated perfectly, I think, by Star Wars, right? Um, you have a situation where if you look back uh, tens of thousands of years in the canon, there has been this conflict between uh, um, uh, the Jedi and the Sith, and, um, uh, and every few centuries, they uh, uh, come back together and, and clash. And uh, when they clash, entire planets are destroyed. Uh, lives are, are ruined, and, um, uh, and war is pervasive. Uh, and this seems to happen over and over again. And uh, we enjoy those stories because they're representative of the dual nature of humanity and, and, and so forth, the eternal struggle within. But in collective journey, um, uh, the, the characters uh, on all sides must somehow um, uh, transcend that. The system actually has to be altered. Could you imagine if the Jedi and Sith somehow <laughs> Uh, uh, came to terms with one another. I mean, after all, that's what the Force really is. It's some kind of combination of them both, isn't it? Um, uh, what's that story like? And, um, and how does it play out? Um, uh, in Collective Journey, the narrative uh, may uh, be nonlinear, right? We are uh, the video game generation. 
Um, and, uh, and those story worlds allow us to choose how to navigate across them. Um, um, and the way we tell stories to one another are often nonlinear across social media. Um, we uh, superposition ourselves, right? Um, uh, we have the roles that we play in the daily life, in, in the, in the re uh, regular physical world, um, but we also have multiple manifestations of ourselves online or in games, um, avatars of ourselves, uh, projections of our personalities that are a little bit different from who we really are, right? And all of those exist in concert uh, across all these media platforms. That's fascinating to me. And, um, and, and could uh, in, in invoke incredible uh, power. Imagine uh, communicating something that is amplified across those uh, platforms. It's how we uh, can generate spontaneous self-organized systems that um, uh, progress us uh, in, into the solution of uh, fantastic problems. And um, uh, collective journey narratives uh, uh, involve uh, multiple perspectives and shifting viewpoints. Um, uh, we um, uh, uh, look through the eyes of each of these uh, characters and allow them to speak um, uh, in such a way that the author uh, somehow sympathizes, love all of your characters and understand them even when they're doing things that are not necessarily uh, happy, <laughs> not necessarily positive. Uh, even uh, destructive and harmful because they are doing it for some kind of, of, of reason. And when we understand those reasons, we have the ability to shift perspectives, to make things better uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, as many of the characters as possible. So collective journey narratives, um, uh, like uh, the ancient communal storytelling practices of the in indigenous Australians, uh, are omnidirectional, um, right? Like video games and social media, online worlds, uh, immersive experience, physically immersive experiences. They're subject to extraordinary scrutiny, right? We can look very deeply into the lore and canon of these uh, uh, properties and come up with uh, uh, extraordinary detail. Um, and we can wildly mis misinterpret them, right? The, uh, the false narratives I was talking about. Um, they uh, uh, are capable of multiple simultaneous variations. Uh, you're seeing this all over the place in terms of, um, of, of variance, in terms of uh, uh, you know, the, the doubling and tripling of characters and universes. Uh, and um, uh, they, uh, these narratives can be inclusive of diverse characters and perspectives allowing us to move out of these kind of tribal notions and into situations where we are communicating and learning about one another uh, and reconciling our differences. Um, the architecture for dialogue is crucial when creating a collective journey narrative. It's not just that you need to create an interactive story. You just need to be aware that that story is going to involve ultimately interactivity because we are going to talk about the stories. You want us to talk about the stories and so a conversation is going to be happening around your story whether you like it or not, right? We will be able to, to change that story as an audience, right? We can alter the story by, by talking about it and giving you the feedback you need so that if you're creating a sequel or if this is an ongoing narrative, uh, uh, you can take that feedback and have it uh, feed into your story. And stories are porous. For the first time in history, we are able to communicate directly to the storyteller, whether that storyteller is uh, Joe Rowling or that storyteller is Donald Trump. <laughs> um, we can. Uh, uh, communicate directly to them and, and make it happen, um, uh, maybe even make change. Uh, so um, uh, the difference here is um, um, in terms of, of uh, uh, hero's journey and collective journey is the difference between the Karate Kid, which is, was a standard hero's journey kind of circular narrative uh, where there was a clear-cut villain 
and uh, a, a good guy who had to learn all these lessons in order to kick the villain in the face um, and, uh, and win, and, and the audience applause. Uh, uh, that was fine in the 1980s. Uh, but now we have Cobra Kai, uh, which is a narrative uh, that is about a, a, a complex system of people who are grappling with things like legacy and patriarchy and the, uh, the need to reconcile with one another in order for the entire system of, of uh, 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 in this case, the martial arts in um, this community, but also the way that people, rich and poor, interrelate, um, uh, fortunate and, and uh, unfortunate interrelate, and, um, and come to terms with one another so that the uh, world can become a, a better place. Uh, we're seeing uh, the rise of collective journey narratives uh, across media because of the advent of long-form storytelling, right? Um, uh, we have these uh, uh, streaming networks that are kind of planetary at, at this point. Uh, amazing, for the first time in history, uh, global uh, kind of TV networks. And, and so uh, these stories, and, and this is good advice for you, your stories need to be communicatable um, uh, to a, a global audience. Worldwide audiences want to see themselves in the stories that are being told. They want to empathize with these various uh, uh, kinds of characters. And that's why um, uh, the diversity of uh, you know, uh, belief systems, nationalities, uh, and perspectives is so important in the work that you do. Um, and, um, and you can see these in, uh, uh, you know, programming as uh, diverse as Arcane, uh, League of Legends, Ted Lasso, and um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the various um, uh, international uh, projects like Squid Games on uh, Netflix. Um, so um, uh, a collective journey to sum it up, are systems in need of repair, whether those systems are a, a, a small family, an entire community, a region, a world, even a galaxy, right? Um, but you have to place meta structures around your work that allow for the audience to somehow communicate and talk about it. Now, some of you are artists that don't want to uh, construct uh, social media superstructures around your uh, your your stories. That's okay, so long as you understand that uh, that someone's going to need to do it, and that your perspective is going to be vital in its execution. Um, uh, so to to break down to kind of give you advice about the um, a way that you can tell stories in a collective journey uh, a manner, um, uh, you have to remember that instead of your story being about a hero who must surmount challenges and defeat antagonists, you are looking at your story world as a system in need of repair, right? Instead of making your conflict linear, you need to design um, uh, the, the characters, uh, locations, and events in such a way that they represent a, a, you know, a systemic a situation that uh, has a flaw in it that no one person can fix. It will take uh, several or many perspectives, conflicts, and the juxtapositions of concepts and ideas, approaches to repair it. Um, we see this in um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of those recent uh, Disney Pixar and Disney films like Turning Red and Encanto. Isn't it fascinating that both of those movies don't have a flat out villain? Uh, they have characters uh, who each represent different perspectives, and, um, and in fact, uh, those perspectives are given validity, right? It's a perspectivist approach that you're taking. Um, uh, and so we empathize with everybody's um, uh, uh, issues, everybody's problems, but we understand that there is going to need to be a reconciliation of these perspectives in order for the world to improve. Um, uh, the next uh, situation, how that improvement happens, is what I call third mind, right? 
uh, the internal journey of at least some of the characters is about learning how to make space to hold, uh, uh, you know, sometimes dramatically different viewpoints in mind and in heart at the same time, right? We don't see too much of this on social media these days, all right? This, pro this process allows for the possibility of a third solution, neither one or the other. Um, it can be a situation where you're holding both these things at once and someone else enters into the picture and makes an observation that sparks a solution. Um, uh, you know, we see this in the climactic episodes of Orange is the New Black as a program is created to help uh, this system of women in prison. That program, by the way, uh, actually manifests itself in real life as the producers um, and uh, Netflix uh, contributed toward the creation of an actual program. Uh, really, really fantastic uh, evidence that collective journey narratives uh, can, uh, can really do well for, for us as a people. Uh, finally, that should be number four, not number five, um, uh, there is reconciliation. Um, it's not enough to project solutions and just solve the problem. We have to avoid repeating these cycles and conflicts so that we, um, uh, so that we have to, you know, acknowledge the emotional injury and make amends to, to one another so that uh, we are not harboring these resentments and this anger uh, which will perpetuate a repeat of the cycle. So... Um, uh, I'm going to leave you with uh, the, uh, this notion of virtual production and how virtual production um, uh, can manifest uh, uh, wonderfully and successfully through a collective journey. Um, in uh, the past couple of years, I've been working on Ultraman, right? The Japanese uh, company, Subaraya Productions, came to me and said, look, uh, Ultraman has not been on the world stage in some years. Uh, we would like to bring it back um, to the West, uh, to Europe, all around the world, because it has continued to be an evergreen property here in Japan. Can you help us uh, uh, bring Ultraman to the world? And, um, and that's a kind of tricky feat, right? Ultraman was considered kind of campy for little kids. Um, uh, it involved uh, a, a giant silver dude from space who comes to Earth to fight giant monsters. Uh, we've seen this a lot with things like Power Rangers and uh, Pacific Rim and, um, uh, you know, uh, this whole kind of subgenre. Um, so uh, what would make uh, Ultraman special? What would make it um, uh, be able to kind of come back to the world uh, in a grand sort of way? The uh, idea I came up with was uh, to first study what made Ultraman special. And it's really a, a kind of remarkable. There are um, a certain things about this property. There's a reason why it lasted all these years in Japan and, and continues to make like $100 million a year or more um, in, uh, in Japan. And that's because there's a, a system of lore and wisdom uh, there is a kind of, of narrative, an aspirational narrative to Ultraman that is distinct and, and, uh, and special, I, I thought. What if we could somehow uh, uh, have this resonate uh, around the world? Uh, the next step was for me to research who knew Ultraman, who understood Ultraman here in the United States. And what we found was there were about 60,000 people um, in, in North America who, uh, who love that character and uh, who are members of various fan clubs and things like that, um, a kind of nostalgia-based, but still, uh, you know, uh, reasonable enough. Um, so um, I thought, what if we could activate those 60,000 fans somehow? What if we can reach, could reach out to them and make them understand that Ultraman was back and that we needed them as a kind of uh, a set of apostles to come and um, uh, show the world how special this character is. Um, the answer to reaching them, uh, uh, we decided, was to create virtual productions. Um, uh, we were actually entering into the, uh, 
the COVID pandemic, unfortunately, at that time. So um, uh, virtual productions were really the only way. We couldn't go to conventions. We couldn't do much else uh, at, at the time. So we um, uh, uh, created uh, an, an LED uh, uh, studio, uh, and you're seeing uh, some of the behind the scenes there um, in uh, Tokyo, Japan, where just a few uh, uh, characters could get dressed up as, as the Ultraman characters, use the actual costumes from the, the show, and, um, uh, and create panels and um, uh, uh, situations where we were live streaming in a virtual production environment to those fans, well, a, a subset of those fans, <laughs> because they didn't even really understand what was going on at first. So there were only really a, a, a few hundred in those first uh, live stream virtual production uh, Ultraman Connection live events. Uh, but little by little, uh, hundreds and then thousands more uh, uh, came to uh, uh, join us and I think the, the real reason wasn't just the spectacle of watching their favorite characters and celebrities talk about uh, Ultraman. It was the fact that we were in social media, that we were acknowledging the fans during these live stream shows, allowing fans to interact directly with uh, the stars of the show and even communicate with the characters at times uh, that caused this kind of explosive uh, 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 re response. We were validating and celebrating um, uh, the fan base, and that allowed us to cultivate uh, a larger and larger audience. We went from 60,000 to 2 million Ultraman fans within the course of about 18 months. Um, we used a software stack uh, uh, that um, uh, involved a good deal of virtual production, not just in Japan but uh, in our own uh, facilities. We uh, uh, it, you know, started creating a virtual environment in Unity and um, uh, uh, you know, developing storylines that uh, expanded upon the canon of Ultraman. It was so much fun. Um, and, um, and we went into places like Discord uh, to, to personally interact with the fans. Uh, it's something that Hollywood almost never lets us do uh, to, to actually communicate with, have conversations with, play with the fans, and invite them in. This created tremendous ardor, tremendous loyalty, and, uh, and now Ultraman is bolstered uh, by millions of, of fans. And, um, and this has come to the attention of our partners at uh, Marvel Comics, and at Netflix and at Lucasfilm Animation, which is now launching a, uh, a massive multi-platform Ultraman franchise. Uh, truly, truly th uh, thrilling. Um, so um, uh, it, it works, people. It truly works. Um, if you want to learn more about um, uh, Collective Journey storytelling, feel free to go to my uh, blog at blog.collectivejourney.com. Um, follow me on um, uh, Twitter at Jeff underscore Gomez. Uh, if you have questions, and I wish I could take questions from you and interact with you here, but unfortunately schedules uh, misalign, so uh, I'm just a recording. <laughs> but feel free to reach out to me uh, through LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, or uh, Twitter, and I'll do my best to, to answer your questions. Um, I want you to understand that even as you're starting out, people, uh, you have a responsibility because you are the future of storytelling. And you're using these incredible tools. And you have to understand that there are kids like the way I was a kid who are uh, searching for maps, searching for ladders to pull themselves out of the limited realities that they are perceiving around them. Your job, in many ways, is to take on that responsibility and, and show us something new. Um, uh, teach us how to move out of our uh, uh, current perceptions and into perceptions that involve a greater possibility uh, to benefit larger numbers of people. Thank you, people, so much for uh, allowing me to speak with you. I'm Jeff Gomez. 
live long and prosper.